good morning, y'all. How you doing? Uh, my name's Logan Moore. I've been going to this church for four years now, which I can't even wrap my head around. But anyway, I just want to welcome everybody. We're glad that you're here. We're, we're very happy for our visitors, if we have any. Um, if you would like to fill out the detachable portion of the bulletin and tear it off and put it in the offering plate, or if you want to take it up front to the Welcome Center and we have a gift for you, whichever one you'd prefer. So if everyone would like to stand up and greet those around you.
You will grab your order of worship and join me as we read together a reading from Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord, I sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord! How profound your thoughts!
I'd like to invite all the children to come join me for the children's message. Carrie, you about beat me down here. Wow. How's it going, everybody? Hey, I brought a couple of pictures to show you guys this morning. I want to see if y'all can tell me what these are. It's a dog. Does anybody want to take a stab at guessing this dog's name? Kira, do you know what dog that is? It is Cooper. This is Cooper the Wonder Dog. I call him that because when we got him from the animal shelter, for about two years, Rebecca and I wondered, what kind of dog is he? We wondered so much, we finally swabbed his mouth with a little cotton swab and put it in the mail and sent to a vet. And it came back and told us that he is part of indeterminate breed groups. <laughs> you know what that means? That means we still wonder. He is still Cooper the Wonder Dog. I've got another animal for you. Start on this side. Who can tell me what this animal is? You know your fish. That is a catfish. I want to tell you a story about Cooper the Wonder Dog and some catfish. Back this spring, Pastor Matt and Rebecca and I worked on a little project together. We put in a garden at our house. We built up a little box and we filled it with dirt. We put in tomato plants and okra plants and pepper plants. But before we did, Pastor Matt gave me kind of a weird gift. He gave me a couple of old milk cartons full of catfish, and we dropped them in all the holes and put the plants in, because it helps the plants grow and be good and strong and healthy and make good fruit. It was just like they did in the film strips I saw when I was growing up. Y'all don't know what film strips are, do you? It was like YouTube for the 1980s. <laughs> so these plants are springing up. I was so proud of my little garden. I took photos on my phone and sent to my mom. I sent to my friends. I was so excited. And then Rebecca and I went and got some milkshakes to celebrate, and we came back, and you know what I found? I found all my plants all over the backyard, and all in between them were bits of the catfish. I was excited about my garden, but Cooper, the wonder dog, was excited about those fish. So what do you think I did after that, Witten? What do you think happened? Anybody have a guess what I did? You think I gathered up all my plants and threw them in the garbage? Do you think I gathered them all up and threw in the fire pit and got rid of them? No, I was proud of my garden. I loved my little garden. So I gathered up all those plants. I put them I, exactly right. I replanted them. I put them back in the dirt, packed around them. And then I went to the hardware store and got some fence and put around them so they'd be safe and they'd grow. And now they're growing and producing fruit. Well, today in the sermon, we're going to hear a Bible story that talks about a man who planted a garden. And it didn't grow at first like he wanted it to. And sometimes that's kind of how God works in our lives. Sometimes we don't really live exactly like God wants us to. Sometimes God is even a little bit disappointed. But what happens, God does not just get rid of us. He doesn't throw anybody away. He's going to keep caring and loving. He'll build up fences to protect us and nurture us and feed us and water us because he loves us so much. Does that sound good to you guys? It's pretty good news, right? Pray with me. God, I thank you for these precious children. Lord, I love them, but I don't love them nearly as much as you love them, Lord. You have made each of them and have a plan for each of them. I pray that they would grow healthy and strong, not just in their, their bodies and their minds, God, but in their spirit. I pray that they would love you. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, kiddos. Love y'all.
please join me in prayer. God, this morning we praise you. We praise you because you are our creator and redeemer. We praise you because you are a friend, a friend who cares about our joys, a friend on whom we can call in difficult times, and a friend who forgives us when we do things that are not pleasing to you. This morning, we also thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you and to gather together with those who also trust in your name. We thank you for the blessings you give us in our lives. As we pause in this moment, let us thank you for the many blessings that abound in our lives. God, we also acknowledge that we have sinned and done things that are against your desires for us. We have been hasty with our words, we have been selfish, and we have disregarded the needs of others. Please forgive us of our sins. God, we also pray for the needs of those around us those in our community and lives who are hurting, struggling, or need to feel your presence. Hear our prayers for those in our lives, community, and world. God, hear our prayers. Thank you again for this opportunity to worship you this morning. As we continue to praise you, may we be drawn closer to you. May we know of your love and your presence in this place. Amen.
Would you pray with me? Lord, you alone are our heart's desire, and we long to worship you. God, this time is yours. We are here for you. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Draw us closer to you in this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. It is a privilege and a joy to be able to fill the pulpit this morning as Matt is away. As many of you will know, he is uh, traveling with a mission group here uh, from FBC. They are down in Ecuador. They have traveled uh, along with our Spanish pastor, Israel Loacamin, who is from Ecuador, and together they are partnering with local believers there. They are doing all kinds of good work, carrying the gospel into the Ecuadorian rainforest. Well, I have lived in Texas for about five years, and ever since moving here, I have missed both the rain and the forest. Uh, Growing up in Tennessee, we had a good bit of both of those things, and here in Waco, we don't have much of either one. But over the last few weeks, I have particularly missed the rain. Dark clouds bring waters, when the bright bring none. John Bunyan wrote those words in his preface to Pilgrim's Progress. He wrote it as a bit of a justification to criticisms that he was taking. Some of his dear friends had written to him and said, John, you're such a good pastor. You're such a good communicator. Why don't you just deliver the truth to us? Why don't you preach another sermon? You have this beautiful treasure of a message. Why are you wrapping it up in this allegory? And that was Bunyan's answer to them. Dark clouds bring waters when the bright bring none. You see, Bunyan understood that sometimes We need a story to to break through that shell that can sort of build up around our hearts. He had taken to heart that message from Psalm 78, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter dark sayings from of old. Over the last few weeks this summer here at First Baptist Waco, we have been looking at some of these dark sayings from the Old Testament. Rebecca preached a few weeks ago from Psalm 78 and From there, Matt has taken us to the the fable of the trees in the book of Judges. And then last week, we looked at a parable that a wise woman brought to King David to confront him when he had grown estranged from his son, Absalom. She used a story to broker some reconciliation. Well, this morning, we have another one of these parables. And this one, like Psalm 78, is, is not just a story, it's also a song. We're going to look at Isaiah 5. Long before the the members of REM met up with each other on the campus of University of Georgia, Isaiah sang, this one goes out to the one I love. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. This is not just any song. It is, it's a story song. It tells a tale. One of the things that I do love about Texas is some of your songwriters. Texans know how to tell a story, and they know how to set it to music, whether it's Waylon or Willie or even Waco's own Billy Joe Shaver. Some of these guys can put a story to music. A few months ago, Pat Pryor shared some tickets with me to go and see uh, Billy, Billy Joe down in Temple. Still trying to figure out why I had to cross county lines to see somebody that lives three miles away, but I'll take it. I went down, my brother went along with me, and we just had a great evening hearing these songs, but as much as I enjoyed the music, the the melodies and the rhythms, it was the story that captivated me, these tales that Billy Joe would tell. And so, while REM might have uh, lifted an opening line from Isaiah 5, this song of the vineyard I would argue has much more in common with one of Billy Joe's. It's got all of the the narrative, all the story, also quite a bit of the grit of one of these Texas singer-songwriter kind of songs. But before I was a fan of Billy Joe Shaver, before I was a fan of Willie Nelson or, or even of Waylon, I was a fan of Sesame Street. 
One of their songs taught me that every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And Isaiah 5 fits that description to a T. This, this story unfolds in three acts. We hear about preparation, accusation, and finally devastation. And that's what I want to walk you through with here for a few minutes. First of all, the, the preparation that this beloved makes for his vineyard. The chapter begins, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. You get a story of preparation. This, this beloved is doing a lot of work. He dug, he cleared, he planted, he, he built a watchtower, he cut out a wine press, he has done all the steps to be a successful vineyard owner. And then he does one more thing. May not seem like taking action at all, but it is. He looked, he waited, he expected. After all this work, he was looking for a return on his investment. Investment of resources, investment of time. This beloved had every reason for these great expectations. He had chosen a good environment for his vineyard. And in agriculture, just like in real estate, the first rule, location, location, location. He situated it on this very fertile hillside. He's used good materials. It says he, he planted good stock. He hadn't gone with any cut rate vine seedlings. He had planted the best. And maybe most importantly of all, he had put in a lot of work. All that clearing and digging and planting, that does not come easily. And he has done every step of the process. And now he sits back and expects a good harvest but when he looks for good grapes, his vines yielded only bad fruit. Bad is a bit of an understatement here. The, the word really has more of a sense of rotten, spoiled, fetid. Have you ever cut an onion in two for a, a sandwich or a salad and had half left over? Maybe you seal it in a Ziploc bag and then you find it about eight months later in the back of your crisper drawer. <laughs> I, I've never done this, of course, but I hear some people do. Maybe, uh, maybe you've gone out and found some of those pork chops that slid out of your HEB bag and you, you find them in the trunk of your car after about a week. They're, they're sort of done medium rare at that point. That's what Isaiah is talking about. This was not just bad fruit, this was bad fruit. It's the word that Exodus uses to describe that manna that the, the Hebrew people kept overnight in defiance of the Lord. He had told them, you've got to trust me for each day. They held some back and they came out the next morning. It was crawling with maggots and they said, this is bad. After all his work, that's what the beloved finds. So the scene shifts a little bit to act two and, and the beloved brings an accusation Read with me, picking back up in verse three. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem, people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard that I haven't done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? You get this refrain again, I expected this, but I got that. So he takes it to the people. He, he goes to the town square and makes his case. The, the love song has quickly changed into a lawsuit. And he says, you all judge, who's, who's in the right here? Me or these vines? Well, it's a rhetorical question because he does not give the jury much time to deliberate. He jumps quickly into the third act of this song and brings this resolution that there's gonna be devastation brought on this vineyard. He says, now I will tell you what I'm going to do. Have any of you ever heard a sentence start that way? 
Ever heard that from a, a parent maybe or, or a coach? Now I'll tell you what's about to happen. It's usually not good news. It's not in this case. The beloved says, I will tell you what I'm gonna do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I'll break down its wall, it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. Where the song opened with this, this beautiful sequence of building, cultivating, farming words, now we get kind of this parallel sequence of destructive words. I will take away, I'll break down, I'll make waste, I'll command drought. There's no ifs, ands, or buts to it. This is, this is what's gonna happen. This frustrated vineyard owner promises. At first, he's simply taking away some of the care. He's, he's removing the hedge, he's, he's breaking down the wall, he's pulling back some of that protection and just kind of letting entropy take its course. In my former work before coming on staff here, I, I traveled back and forth to Angola Prison in Louisiana pretty frequently. It's the, the largest maximum security prison in America. I got to know their longtime warden there, Burl Kane, pretty well. One of the things he told me over and over was, Josh, things just don't stay fixed. Nothing stays fixed. I learned that from him. You've probably heard Matt say it from, from this platform. It was true of managing a prison. I found it to be true sometimes in the life of the church. It's certainly true in my own life. It's just part of living in a fallen world. Things break down. You come out in the morning and your tire has gone flat. It hits the triple digits and your air conditioning unit goes out. It's late Friday afternoon and your paper folding machine breaks right after you've printed off all the worship guides. <laughs> Things don't stay fixed. And at first, that's what the beloved says about his vineyard. He's just gonna take away some of that protection and let things play out a little bit. Sometimes this is similar to how God operates in our lives. Some of the most effective ways of catching our attention are just letting us feel a little bit of the consequences of our own choices and actions. It's not very pleasant at the time, but it can be very merciful. It's a way of capturing our, our attention, drawing us back before something worse happens. But in this story of the vineyard, it does not have the desired result. In verse six, the beloved vineyard owner goes to a little more direct confrontation. After taking away the hedge, after breaking down the wall, he promises, I will make it a wasteland. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vines have had their chance to, to grow and flourish and they're not cooperating, and so judgment is coming. Walter Brueggemann sums up this verse by writing, the time of the vineyard is ended. It will become, as we say in the South, only a patch of kudzu vine. Now, Walter lives in Atlanta. I have full trust that he would not invoke that voracious vine lightly. Time of the vineyard is over. Only a patch of kudzu remains. Well, verse six ends the song, but then in verse seven, Isaiah comes and starts spelling out what he means by it. He's sung this song, he's told this story, and only now at the end does he reveal who he's been talking about all along. You can imagine the people standing around him wondering, they, they would have had plenty of neighbors, plenty in their own midst who planted vineyards. I picture them looking around to each other. Is, is he talking about you? Was, was this your vineyard? Was it yours? What happened here? Instead, Isaiah tells him, no, the vineyard belongs to the Lord Almighty, the creator, the one who, who brought our people out of slavery in Egypt, the one that we go up to the temple to worship. That's the vineyard owner. You picture the people around him all of a sudden saying, oh gosh, we're, we're not really talking about agriculture at all, are we? He tells them, no, 
The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Just like Nathan went after telling a story to King David to confront him about his sin with Bathsheba and said, thou art the man. Here Isaiah turns to his whole community, all his neighbors, everyone around him and says, all of us together, we are these, these rotten, spoiled vines bringing forth rotten, spoiled fruit. He makes clear exactly how they've fallen short with this, this wordplay. Uh, very literally, it says, the Lord expected justice, but bloodshed, righteousness, but outcry. He jams these contrasting words right up beside each other. And in the original language, there's only one letter's difference in the words of each pair. They sound so, so similar, but the reality they're describing could not be more different. In effect, the Lord is saying to the people, I expected you to live in harmony with each other and with me. Instead, what I found were bloody hands and embalming lips, found violence, I heard outcry. Well, it would be easy for us to, our mind's eye come and stand shoulder to shoulder with Isaiah and join him in, in pointing the finger. And, yeah, Judah, yeah, Jerusalem, why, why didn't you do better than this? Why didn't you get it together? It's easy for us to cast the blame. But I think wisdom demands of us that we take a step back and ask ourselves, do we maybe see ourselves reflected somewhere else in the story? What might we have in common with Judah and Jerusalem? Might we be part of some of those vines bringing forth the spoiled fruit? How are we complicit in a a society of violence and vulnerability. Got to at least ask the question. Got to ask it of our own hearts, our own spirits. If we find that we share some of the blame, then we've got to ask, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? Now, one approach would be just to recommit ourselves as as a friend of mine in seminary said once, don't be sorry, just do better. We can just recommit and double down. We can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and try and turn this rotten fruit into something appealing, something good. But I think that would be the wrong approach. If these dark stories of the Old Testament teach us anything, it's that futility of trying to bear good fruit for the Lord in our own strength. A lot of ways the Old Testament is just the succession of stories of people trying and failing to do that, punctuated by, by seasons of faithfulness and seasons of grace, but generally it's, it's this downward spiral. So I'm not here to bring some kind of motivational speech or to stump for some kind of bootstrap religion of don't be sorry, just do better. That sort of approach might work for Coach Taylor and the Dillon Panthers at halftime, but if we bring that to our souls, it's gonna leave us with nothing but kudzu vines and catfish bones. So instead, in in the moments we have left, I wanna bring good news. I wanna bring the gospel. Can I take you to Jesus? Jesus loved the Old Testament. It was his Bible. And all throughout the Gospels, he he quotes Isaiah over and over, more than any other book except for Psalms and Deuteronomy. And he knew this particular passage, Isaiah 5, very well. He uh, riffed on the song of the vineyard throughout his ministry, doing parables that would put his own spin on these stories. Uh, Most especially, he does it in Matthew 21. But... That's not the passage I want to turn to now. Instead, I want to look at John 15. John does something different than 
Matthew and Mark and Luke. They record a lot of Jesus' parables, and including some of these riffs on the Song of the Vineyard, but John preferred instead to give these brief, arresting sort of portraits of Jesus, these snapshots of who Jesus is. Things like, I am the light, I am the bread, I'm the door, the gate, the shepherd. And here in John 15, I am the true vine. I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Jesus tells the people, you, you remember that beloved vine grower, that Lord Almighty? Yeah, that's, that's my father. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Here in this, this snapshot of Jesus as the true vine, he, he brings a surprising answer to that rhetorical question that the beloved asks in Isaiah. Remember in that scene of accusation, the beloved says, what more could have been done for this vineyard? In Isaiah's day, presumably the answer was, Nothing more, you've, you've exhausted all the options. You've, you've cleared, you've dug, you've planted, you've done everything right. But centuries later, here in, in John, Jesus pulls back the curtain, says, no, the beloved had one more idea, one more thing he wanted to try. He said, what if I sent my son to become the vine? That's just what happened. Jesus came and lived among his people. With his death on the cross and, and burial, he was quite literally planted in the earth. And then three days later, he burst forth, this, just like the, the first shoots of springtime, bringing new life. And ever since then, that vine has been growing and bearing fruit in the world. And Jesus' invitation here is, come be part of it with me. I'm the vine. You can be the branches. Come be grafted in and bear fruit in and with and through me. That's Jesus' invitation. That's, that's my invitation to you today. If you're tired of striving to get things right on your own, if you're tired of trying to bear fruit of love and hope and joy in your life and in the world, maybe you don't need to try so hard yourself, but just need to be joined to Jesus. Maybe some of you have trusted Jesus for a long time, but are still striving in your own strength and growing frustrated. My invitation to you is rest in Jesus. Spend time with him. Abide in him. Certainly there's work to be done. We cooperate along with the Spirit of God, but mostly it's just a matter of remaining close to the vine, drawing our life through him. And some of you are in seasons of pruning, difficult times of life. I want to encourage you to take that not as condemnation, not as judgment on you, but as evidence of fruitfulness. The, the vineyard owner prunes the branches bearing fruit so that they will bear more and more for the kingdom of God. Jesus is the true vine. The Father is that beloved gardener. And Jesus invites us, come, be joined, and draw our life from him. It's my invitation to you today. Won't you come? Jesus, we are grateful for the life that you give. You are the true vine, Lord, and we thank you for coming and dying and living again for us so that we might bear fruit in you. Jesus, keep us close to you. That's the prayer of my heart, my prayer for these, your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
We've got three quick announcements before the benediction. Uh, the first, today is the last day to sign up for uh, providing school uniforms for those in need. You can find more information in the foyer. Uh, secondly, Michelle Martin's concert is next Sunday at 5 o'clock. And then thirdly, uh, continue to pray for our uh, team in Ecuador as they um, have stretched themselves and gone so far to share the love of Jesus. We want to support them with prayer here today. Uh, join me uh, with the uh, benediction in the order of service at the bottom. Go with us, Lord, and guide the way through this and every coming day, that in your spirit, strong and true, our lives may be our gift to you. Go in his peace.